welcome to the next episode of Sawdust Nation with Josh. Jo- Josh, you, you there? <clears throat> oh, dude, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, wait, Josh, are, are you, are, you can't are be are falling we, asleep. Are we recording right now? Yeah, we are. We're recording right now. Oh, where well, were we? What, what are you doing? Falling asleep? Did you do the intro? I I don't know where we're, where we are. Jo- Man, I, I just start. I just started. No, I'll, I'll start again. Okay. Um, I'll pay attention this time. All right. Don't fall asleep. So, everybody, welcome to the next episode of Sawdust Nation with Josh from North Country Woodworking and AJ from Crafton in New Jersey. <coughs> jo- Josh. Oh, Josh, my, you can't oh be God. falling asleep. I am so sorry, everybody. You know, when I said I'm going to have a blackout there for a little while if I had a baby? Well, that occurred on the 16th of September, around 9 o'clock. Our little jelly bean arrived in this world. She was seven <laughs> pounds, 14 ounces, and she looks like me, Grass. poor soul. So, if, I'm, <laughs> if I am a little bit tired this episode, and he keeps having to wake me up, you all know why. But let's kick this off of what's going on in our workshop. AJ, what do you have going on? Man, it's, uh, it's been a hectic time in this workshop lately. But I've been learning a lot and made some new, you know, um, new jigs to help me out with some projects. And actually, a couple of the jigs were built by built for necessity because I was building a uh, a ring box for my upcoming wedding, and I needed to do splines in it. I've never done splines before, and I looked online real quick, made a couple jigs, and it worked out really well. It was actually uh, I made it and it worked. I didn't have to make it, then remake it and redo it again and again. Um, also made a cross cut sled, my very first one. Um, it's as true as a good Harbor Freight square is a straight. So, <laughs> and I used a little bit of unnecessary walnut as the runners. But when I put the runners down, I didn't realize I cut them just a hair too small. So when I placed them onto the, the sled itself, I get a little slop in them, so what I'm gonna have to do is redo them. But I like it because it's a walnut and it's nice touch, uh, you know, on the on the plywood sled. Um, other than you know the jigs, I did make that ring box. It came out amazing. And um, go ahead, it did. Man. I know you got it, questions. It, it came out amazing. So I do have a question. I mean, I think yeah. you hit on it on one of your stories, but it's quite large. Like it's very tall. Is there a reason why you made it so tall? Or is it just like you're laughing? So you know, I'm curious. The, the the reason is, you know, I, we've talked about it many times before. I can't, or I not that I can't. I never could resaw, and I had a piece of walnut that was already S4S. It was a rustic piece of walnut from Boards and Beams, and the reason that it's rustic is it's got a lot of knots, you know, voids. But I found a nice clean piece, and I was like, I really want to make a box. I wanted to make a ring box for Kim. And so I found this piece of walnut and I didn't trim it down to a a decent size. So all I did was I chopped it into like this six inch piece. And it was already, I think like five inches tall and I resawed it, but I didn't resaw it on my Rikon. I resawed it on my old Wen bandsaw because my Rikon, I need a new blade. I really got to fine tune it. And, um, I just left it as is the same height. I didn't play around with it because I think the other thing was I was a little too scared of having small pieces. So I didn't want to use the table saw with tiny little pieces because I did not have a cross cut sled at that moment in time. I mean, you want to keep all your fingers. I mean, what fun is that? Yeah. Well, if I had a saw stop, it'd be a little bit different, but unfortunately I don't. Saw stop. If you're listening, there's two, there's two people right here that would love to have your table saw. (laughs) Hey, I don't need a I don't need a big three horse. I, I can live no. with a, a 1.5. If I had the three horse, I couldn't power anything else in my shop at the same time. <laughs> in fact, in the house, we shut off all the lights. The dryer couldn't be running. It would be <laughs> it would just like, okay, gonna start the table saw. I you know that you just hit on the the funniest thing that happens to me, not so often in the shop, but every once in a while. My garage, when they wired it up, when they built this house, they must have put 30 different outlets on this one circuit. And of course, my table saw is on that circuit and it's 115. I'm not running 220 yet. And um, every once in a blue moon, if I catch it at the right time, I flick the on off switch on and literally all the lights in the shop just go completely black. And I'm like, oh, man. 
<laughs> so now I walk in the back room and I got to turn the breaker back on and everything's fine after that. But it's always just that one time when I catch it just right. So it, it's happened to me a couple times and luckily I wasn't in the middle of a cut. That was really good. Um, and it just didn't good thing. Breakers don't automatically come back on because that would really, really suck. Oh yeah, man. That's very dangerous. And you know, we've oh, talked yeah. about my shop too and how mine's not really wired to be a shop. And I have two circuits in there and the majority of the outlets are on one circuit, but, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I could maintain a three horsepower. So I'll stop in there if I wanted to. No, definitely. You got to go two twenty and dedicate it on its own circuit. And that's, Eventually, what I would like to do with the uh, table saw, because I heard that, you know, the, the rigid one that I have, when you convert it over to 220, it just runs better. It runs smoother, it has a little bit more power to it, and it uses less amps, too, you know, since it you're makes running sense. higher voltage. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would, yeah. I mean, eventually, you know, when we actually get a house and I get a, you know, shop that I kind of want, it, I'll, I'll definitely have the circuits in a setup that I want. I mean, this is a learning mm-hmm. curve. This is allowing me to set up a shop when I go somewhere else and like know what I like. But uh Oh yeah. Let's hear more about these jigs in your ring box. Well, that that ring box was made out of walnut. Um and then on the splines I did Paduke and Purple Heart. And the reason that I wound up with the Paduke and the Purple Heart was because of Kim. Kim was under the impression this whole time, and I made it because I didn't, I wanted to surprise her with it. And I kept on saying, I wanted to learn. So I'm making a box because I want to learn. And what better project to learn on? And I kept doing new things and, you know, building the spline jig, doing the splines, uh, resawing. I learned three things right there, which was real valuable to me. Now I can use them for other projects. And, you know, she's really, she fell in love with the box. She's like, wow, this just looks really good. Just like, what are you doing it for? I said, I'm, I'm literally doing it just because I, I can, like, I want to learn. And after I get it all done, I, you know, sand it all nice and smooth, cut the top off on the crosscut sled. And, um, I've never used a sled before. So it was kind of a little scary moment. You know, I'm, I'm holding this little box and now I'm trying to cut it without cutting my thumbs off while holding the, the sled, but I put enough wood in the back. So I, I, I would hit that wood prior to my thumbs, if that makes sense. And then um, once I got it all done, I sanded the edges all nice and uh, rounded, did a little round over on the top and bottom, and um, finished it off with some uh, walrus oil furniture wax and let it sit for 10, 15 minutes, buffed, buffed it out, and then surprised her with it. I sneaked in and stole the rings and then um, put them in the box. So I surprised her with the rings in the box. And uh, it was it was actually quite funny because she kept on telling asking me where I put the rings, and I, I kept on blaming it on her because I kept on saying, "You're the one who put the rings in in a certain spot that I don't even know about." I had no idea where they were, so I, it was easy to blame her. I'm like, I didn't put them anywhere, and she admitted. She goes, "Well, I've tried mine on a couple times." I go, "Did you leave it upstairs? You know, maybe maybe you left it upstairs." So when she went upstairs, I snuck in and and uh, surprised her with it. And she loved it. Um, she took the little ring box that she had um, and pretty much just put it to the side and was like, that one's not needed anymore. We're, we're good with this one. So um, that turned out really well. It turned out amazing, man. Like you, the work that you did on that definitely, uh, it's not only increased your skill set, but it's also something that you can keep as a memory because, you yeah, know, yeah. you learned it, you made it, and it's going to be part of your life in a big way here soon. Um, Mm -hmm. you actually beat me to the spine dick. I've been wanting to make one for a while and I just, I just haven't, I haven't had a need for it. So when I saw you make it, I'm like, I'm going to have to sit down and do that because I mean, like it adds that character to a box that, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, I mean, there's different ways of doing it. You could do it, you know, the way I did with your mallet and run it through, you know, my bandsaw, you know, create that space, put something in there, you know, flush, but a spine jig on the table saw. It just, it's a very useful jig, especially when you start doing larger boxes and stuff Mm -hmm. and it is more accurate and gives you a little bit more space and, you know, the width of a bandsaw blade. And when you do get ready, definitely contact me and I'll go over. uh, I followed plans and then mixed the plans to my own liking because of course I look at pictures I don't read. 
And um, I looked at the pictures, went, oh, okay, I could do that. Forgot how the picture was, put it together the way I thought it was, and looked at the picture and went, ah, man, one thing is backwards. But the, I, it's hard to explain on the podcast, so I'll have to show you in, in a picture what this gentleman did, which actually would make it work better because it would have a flat surface on the bottom to slide on the, on the table saw. Mine sits, I mean, like a millimeter away, but it's locked onto the uh, table saw fence. So it can't, it can't tilt, you know, over. So the splines are going to be straight no matter what. And with it sliding on the table saw fence, it was nice because I needed to make splines in multiple locations. So I made one. I knew that they were going to be the same height from the top and the bottom, but then I needed to do one in the middle. So all I did was I slid my uh, fence over and then did another spline. And that was kind of another reason that box wound up so big is because I wanted three splines, but I didn't want to sacrifice the walnut because it was, it was too gorgeous for me to already, like it's already put together. So I didn't want to have to chop a middle section out. So I said, let me just keep it the way it is. See if it even turns out good. And lo and behold, it actually turned out amazing. And what was more amazing was that the top is held on with little magnets that are, and I can't stress, <laughs> I can't stress to everybody out there, when you buy stuff on Amazon, make sure you read and look at the pictures 100% before you place this order. Because I thought these things were going to maybe be as big as a pencil eraser. <sighs> They're three millimeters wide and they are absolutely tiny. I mean, they fit really nice because they're so small. But I was like, what am I going to do with these little magnets? So anyway, I needed to get them pounded into the walnut. So I took Josh's mallet that he made me and I used that big mat, that big mallet to hammer in those tiny little magnets. Let me tell you, it worked out so well because the weight of it, literally, I literally swung it, just tapped it. And that, that magnet went right in, no problem. That's an awesome mallet, and I cannot wait to use it on further projects. But, you know, besides the ring box, I got more orders that just came through for flags, uh, wavy flags, flat flags, big ones, small ones, you name it. I got them, so it's kind of nice. Um, I still have the, whoa, did I mention the tools today? I don't Not think Yeah, in the podcast, you haven't. Oh, so for the people who have been listening – and heard me tease it twice already about a upcoming project that was in the works and I didn't know, you know, which way it was going to go. Um, I was in contact with tools today and about a project. And all I kind of said to them was, you know, I would love to put your logo on one of my wavy flags because they were messaging me back and forth about the wavy flags. And um, they said, how about, you work with us and we can do a, you can do a project for us all in the CNC. So I got the pleasure of doing a wavy flag with the tools today logo all done on the CNC. And that's going to be started probably sometime next week. Um, with the wedding, I can't do anything. So I'm, I am beyond excited about this because I mean, I've been buying stuff from tools today for a while now, especially since I got the CNC and they are so amazing over there. I, if you haven't, if you haven't used them, definitely head over there and, and pick up a router bit or something like that. Their customer service and their attention to just answer every single question that you have is amazing. I'm, there's not a lot of companies out there that put the time and energy into a company that like this. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's awesome. They sent me some bits to use. Um, I got, you know, uh, a 3d bit, which is going to be my very first time using it, but man, this thing, just the rendering that I posted up, I love that thing, how it looks on the rendering. And I can't wait to duplicate that, um, stars, stripes, and the tools today logo plus the waves are all going to be done on the CNC. The only thing I'm going to do is finish it. And, um, I actually, I have walnut butcher block that I'm going to be using. It's a butcher block top, like a counter. Mm -hmm. Some guy was getting rid of it because it didn't fit. He cut it, went to go install it in his house and went, oh, it doesn't fit. 
So it's brand new, never used. So I, I got it for like 20 bucks and this thing's like eight feet long. It's in two sections, but I'm going to use that. Hmm. I wish I could get my hands on something like that. Oh man. Like I need to see a picture of that piece. Like I, I can't yeah. wait to see a, your project with tools today complete, but doing it in a walnut on top of it. I'm jealous, man. It's a great opportunity for you and can't wait to see all that is completed. Now, I mean, this is your first flag you're doing all in the CNC. I mean, that's that's pretty cool. That can almost change, you know, your whole production. If, you know, once this is done and said, you you might be able to do one on the actual CNC while you're doing one in the yard or two in the yard. You know, I was thinking about it and um, I, I want to see how this one turns out. And if it comes out really well, what I can do is I can batch out a few flags, keep them as stock and then sell them like that. Um, I truly enjoy making them myself because, you know, it's just that handmade aspect. You know, instead of pushing a button and out pops a flag, then, you know, you still have, I like building it from literally start to finish and knowing that it's my work. And, um, but if I can get this, you know, dialed in and set right, I can do small, like maybe... You know, set, uh, my smallest one is 17 inches wide. So if I could do that and batch out maybe a couple of them within a week, because I mean, this flag has so much detail and whatnot. This flag is going to take in total, Vetric is estimating like 25 hours. So <laughs> the detail finish um, or the detail pass just for the Tools Today logo. Now, this. You have to understand when I re-rendered it because they said I'm we're going to send you a detailing bit. When I re-rendered it, just the detailing pass alone is 17 hours for the, just the details. For the de- oh, detail, no, n- not the detail of the whole flag. Detail of just the tools today logo, and that's it. Wow, that's 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 hard to believe. It when I watched the rendering of how it how it worked. I mean, it was going, I mean, this, this detail, um, bit is a a micro point. And so it's real small, so it can get all those fine details, but I mean, it was stepping so small lines and my feed and speed was set like normal. You know, it's not too slow. It's not too fast. It's kind of, you know, middle of the road. And I was like 17 hours. I'm like, where, how am I going to do this? I'm actually going to have to break this flag up into, multiple days. And then just that carve alone, I'm going to have to break up into a weekend, a Saturday and Sunday. Wow. That's, that's, because, that's incredible, man. Like, so anyway, yeah, no, I didn't mean anyway like that. I I was going to let you tell you, tell us what, uh, what is on in your shop, but you were going to say something about the flag, right? Yeah. I mean, like I really am looking forward to seeing how this turns out. Like, first of all, you got my attention when you said walnut. It has to be good. <laughs> you you and me both. We're both looking forward to this because I'm curious on it too. But yeah, it's going to generate a lot of content for you. And I, I can't wait to watch those stories and what you have uh, posted up upon that. But talking about what's going on in my shop, not much. The shop has been closed. Um, You know, big, big event just happened. And <laughs> we're just kind of get the house and everyone in it ready and uh, operating on the same page. Uh, having a newborn in the house definitely adds to some of the uh, <laughs> some of the challenges of everyday life. But uh, oh yeah, woodworking wise, let's see. So I know I've talked about the farmhouse table. Um, I actually had to contact that client and explain to them I wasn't able to complete that in their timeline. Their move time actually got moved up a couple weeks, and I wasn't able to make a table in a week um, with having that newborn in the house. So it hurt. I, you know, it hurt giving that deposit back. It hurt saying that I could not complete a piece in the timeline because usually I just bust my butt and get it done. But it's a learning curve. It's something that I think, at least for me, I never thought I was going to have to do. But uh, I ended up having to do it. So hopefully never again. But uh, mm-hmm. it was just, it was, it took a day for me to be like, oh, <laughs> it was definitely necessary. I kept going back and forth in my head. But okay, moving on from that, let's see. I have a quote on a knock on a wood block, something I did not know existed. But I was contacted by a client that was interested in me doing a small, I think they said it was four inches by five, about inch thick or so, 
They didn't care what kind of wood, and they just want knock on wood with their name engraved on it. And I was like, okay, I got to look this up. Is this a thing? It is. <laughs> it's truly a thing. I guess when people say, you know, knock on wood, some people don't have a piece of wood to knock on. <laughs> so they, they have this little piece on their desk or what have you, and they knock on that. Cool. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I, it'd be a nice little project to knock out, especially because, you know, Doing up a little uh, piece like that and then throwing in a laser engraver, it's a small project. You know, I can generate some stuff off that. Other than that, I still had that cheese board sitting in uh, the workshop as well. The top is still tacky from the epoxy that I poured on top of it. Now, AJ, me and you were talking, you know, previous to the episode and it, we were talking about it could be weather. Um, it's it's definitely dry. You know, it's not like it's moving like a gel or anything. Mm-hmm. Just a bit tacky on top. So I'm actually going to bring it inside where it's actually more stable in temperature and give it a day or so and see what happens. Um, hopefully that cures completely. I can sand it down, get it to the customer because all these little projects I like to get knocked out and to the customer so I don't have to worry about them. Then I have uh, the little serving board that I'm doing that's I think 32 inches uh, circular. That's going to be out of ash. I have to finish processing the slab and gluing that together and doing the laser engraving for that so they can give that gift as well. Um, other than that, Com- uh, excuse me, Kumo's workshop, he contacted me and he's actually interested in a mallet. So he sent me over nice. his logo. Yeah. He sent me over his logo and I'm going to make a mallet for him as well. Um, I love making these mallets and if people want them, go ahead and contact me. I would love to, you know, sit down and talk details and what you'd like. Then the last one is a special mention for uh, this podcast, Woodworker Max. This guy has been listening to our Instagram lives. He's been interacting with us for, well, I don't know, for the majority of the time. I've been on Instagram, essentially. Mm-hmm. And he's been doing his marquee marketry, marketry, excuse me. I've heard of it, but I've never even attempted it. And this guy is taking, you know, um, a piece of wood, you know, chiseling out um, sections and then basically doing inlays with the chisel. I'm sure there's a, a finer definition than what I just gave you guys, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, basics here. And his first one turned out great. And then he did a second one that turned out even better. I believe he has a very natural talent when it comes to doing the marketry. And I reached out to him. I'm like, hey, man, I really want one for my shop. Recognizing raw talent right off the bat is not something, you know, I've done a lot of but you could definitely tell that his passion for woodworking is there and Mm -hmm. he's been working on his second piece and when he posted that it he he definitely has a talent there and i really want to showcase that in my shop because you know i think he deserves you know that's not that spotlight but you know i i want to be able to look at it and realize like you know everyone out there has a talent and we're all just on Instagram and doing woodworking because we love doing what we do. Sometimes we just hit on something that we're just really good at. And Woodworker yeah. Max, man, you I think you hit your, your thing. So that's what I got going on in my workshop. Not too much, not like I usually do where it's like 10 things in the works and 10 things coming. <laughs> but uh, it's going to be slow for a little while, then I'll get back into it. I got some inquiries, but uh, I haven't really answered them back quite yet just due to how busy things have been. And, you know, I, I, I do have some things I need to complete before I start going down another rabbit hole. Uh, with your epoxy, when you say tacky, now I know of not even just epoxy, but like I've felt things before, but it feels like it's tacky because like your skin's just, how can I say this? Your skin's like sticking to it maybe a little bit, but it's not the product that's tacky. It's just like your hand is just like, because of the type of finish it is, are you sure that it's definitely tacky? Well, okay. So I haven't been in the shop that often. And when I say tacky, I went out and I it looked dry. I picked it up. And like you said, I felt like my skin was sticking to it a little bit. Now I haven't taken a sander to it or anything to see if I can mm-hmm. get that coat off and see if it's just that final coat. But it can't hurt anything for me to bring inside to see if it changes oh, anything yeah. overnight. And if it don't, I'll bring it out. I'll sand it and see what happens. I mean, like, I can laser engrave another piece of wood because out of the piece that you saw is actually from a 32 inch section that I have. It it bowed on me after I processed it and then resawed it. 
So mm. what I did is I cut it down and ran it through my new um, drum sander. My new drum sander, and <laughs> you know it flattened out the pieces perfectly. Because before, you know, I would have to use a planner, and then it was just a process. Drum sander saves me so much time. As soon as I got it, this is one of the first things I did. So if it doesn't work out, I'll redo it, and I'll just make sure that when I mix it this next time, because I use a scale, and I, I do exact amounts each time, but I'm pretty sure maybe something got stuck on the side or I didn't mix it that great. I use my drill with a spoon, and I mixed it up that mm -hmm. way, which usually I don't have any issues with. You know, it could be the weather. Um, epoxy is just, I am not a master when it comes to epoxy and I've had my issues and I'm just hoping that, uh, you might be right. It might be just, you know, the feel, my feel, or yeah. it could be, you know, it just needs a night inside where it's a little bit warmer. Who knows? Maybe. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that it's, it's just like a, a feeling. I mean, you probably know what I'm talking about. Like if you, if you ran your hand over something, it might feel like it's tacky, but it's actually it's not it's just the way the finish is versus how your uh, skin is maybe your hands a little damp and it feels like it's sticking almost if that makes any sense but i guess you got to see yeah i mean i'll try it tonight and uh see how it goes i mean it's not gonna yeah. hurt anything so you know i <laughs> no, i did do all. some 3d printing too um i guess <laughs> uh we came home and my my son was like hey you know, can we do something on the printer? So I said, yeah, and we did a dinosaur puzzle thing where basically you print out all the uh, skeleton structure of a T-Rex and then you put it together. And uh, it, it was pretty cool. The pieces were a little too thin. So next time mm -hmm. I print that, I'm going to you know, beef them up a little bit because they were so flexible that some pieces were hard to put together. But uh, nice. yeah, it's, it's nice to have a 3D printer where you can come home and be like, you know, Hey, let's let's do a project and within an hour or two have something you could put together. That's awesome, man. Speaking of 3D printers, mine was going over the the weekend like crazy. And, you know, just printing the same stuff. Um, but I wanted more because I, I my buddy doesn't live too far away from me. He just moved in, he's trying to build his garage and he's got Milwaukee tools as well. So, you know, I'm printing him up so he, the tool holders, the battery holders, and I'm just giving them to him, you know. I'm not trying to make anything off of it. So, um, so I'm going to give those to them, um, some of the M12 holders for the Milwaukee system and just a couple other odds and ends, but man, that thing's been going nonstop. And, uh, it, my, my father actually just received his new one and I can't wait until he, I keep bugging him. I'm like, did you open the box yet? Did you put it together yet? Did you, did you open it yet? I'm, I'm tomorrow. If he hasn't opened it, I'm going to say, just give it to me. I'll put it together. And I want to use it first because I want to build some bigger things and I can't on the one that I have right now, you know, they hang over just the, the area that I can print in. They hang over just so much, just so little that the printer says, no, I can't print because it's outside the zone. And, um, so I got to go over there and steal his so I can print. What did he get? I mean, what model? He got a... It was on Kickstarter. He, my father loves to go on Kickstarter and, and, you know, find new upcoming things. But I believe – I'm going to actually look it up while I'm telling you. I think it's a Snap Maker. Oh, um, I really – oh, I've been eyeing that Kickstarter for a while. So if it's the same thing I'm thinking of, you can do 3D printing, you can do laser, and you could do uh, like a small CNC. Yep, you got it. Um, he, You know, he got the whole King Caboodle. He got – Laser 3D and CNC. Um, I mean, I'm looking at a picture right now. It looks pretty cool. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, because it has a CNC function. Wait, you were saying your laser didn't have a Z axis, right? Not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this has to, since it's a CNC. It's got everything. Some lasers do have a Z axis that is uh, mm -hmm. basically by a stepper motor. And that's how they focus the actual laser. For mine being a diode, oh. there's a knob on the bottom near where the laser comes out, the lens, and I actually turn that clockwise or counterclockwise to dial in the actual hmm. laser versus raising wow. it on the Z-axis. I did not know that, and that makes a lot of sense. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, um, that's one of the reasons I actually printed uh, a part for my Z-axis, so that hmm. I can actually have more functionality, because... Right now, if I throw, let's say, uh, 
two by four or whatever underneath my laser. It's so close to the actual laser. I have to raise the entire system up. Wow. So instead of moving my bed, which I want to kind of keep, you know, the frame, I should say, instead of moving the frame up mm-hmm. and down, I printed out something on the 3D printer that moves my laser on the Z axis up and down, which gives me that, you know, versatility of not having to throw, uh, you know, two by fours underneath my legs to raise it up and then <laughs> print. Um, it's worked in the past and it works fairly well. It doesn't create enough, uh, movement where it's going to fall off or anything crazy. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, if you always have it in the same location and you have references in that location, it makes things easier like every other CNC machine. But let's, yeah. let's go back to talking about your dad's new 3D printer because <laughs> I'll be watching this very closely, hoping that you play with it and uh, report back because this Kickstart Kickstarter is amazing, and I've been watching it very closely. I think they're on like the third generation, and they're coming out with a lot of stuff for it. Yeah, the one that because he did tell me, you know, it's the, all of them, you know, the CNC, the laser, and the three D printer, and I believe at, in passing he told me it was the Snap Maker. I could have could be wrong, but I don't believe so. The Snapmaker 2.0. So it's like their biggest, bestest, fastest that they made. I mean, it it's pretty it's pretty big, beefy. I mean, it looks really, really cool. Um, I don't remember. I know you and I went over this once before. Um, but it has a 320 millimeter wide by 330 deep bed, and it can print up to 350 millimeters high. Okay. So, I mean, it, you know, it's pretty decent in size. So um, I'm excited for it because I know he's been long awaiting this. It got lost with UPS. It, it, was, it went through hell getting here. And actually one piece is still missing and he doesn't know when it'll be here. But he doesn't even know what piece is missing because he still hasn't unboxed the damn thing. So... <laughs> I go over there the other night. I'm like, uh, I keep looking at the the box. I'm going, you didn't open the box yet? He's had the box for like five days now. The second it arrived, I'd be ripping that box open to see what it was, especially waiting, you know, so long, especially on Kickstarter, you know, you wait yeah. until it ends, then they ship them out. I mean, I was so anxious for the CNC to show up. That came off of Kickstarter as well. The, I mean, the moment it arrived, my knife was out and I opened up the box just to see what was inside. I couldn't put anything together because it was at work, but I still wanted to see what was inside. Yeah, because you're excited. have been waiting for this for a long time. You <laughs> want to open it, put it together, put it at work. That's awesome, man. Like, I'm going to follow that very closely, you know. Make sure uh, you let me know how that, you know, is operating. I definitely will. I'm I'm hoping that he's just going to say, look, I, just come over and just put it together. Like, I don't have enough time for this <laughs> because it comes in pieces. So he said, you have to build it. Uh, I'll probably be there helping him out, build it. Once I do that, I definitely will be taking pictures, videos, um, maybe do some stories on it and hopefully get it running. And then maybe I'll be able to print, you know, a nice test piece or something like that and see how this thing goes. It looks robust. I mean, it, it looks really, really awesome. That's one of the things that drew me to it is when I was looking at uh, 3D printers is that uh, how it's made. It's it's all metal. Mm. And it's like the way they build it, it's pretty easy to put together. It is a module. That way you can make a bigger bed later on. Mm-hmm. You can change it up, put two together, what have you. And they're continuing to put stuff out. It's not something that like, you know, was on Kickstarter. This is it. It's on 2.0. Yep. I mean, like, they're constantly making stuff for this because it's doing so well. Oh, yeah. A lot of these companies are going over to Kickstarter, even though the uh, the company is already established and they already have a big following. I've been looking at Kickstarter myself, and even with the CNC, that, the company who built that is Millwright. Millwright has been making CNCs for a while now. They only threw it up on... Uh, Kickstarter to get a different audience, you know, yeah. um, because they already had their target audience, but they wanted more people to to follow along. And that's exactly what happened. A lot of people who did not know who they were found out who they were. So, um, I mean, Kickstarter is awesome for this kind of stuff. And I'm really excited for them. I'm really excited for myself as well, because then I get to build nice, 
big 3D prints. And um, I'll definitely let everybody follow along. And I'll definitely keep you in the loop on it as well. Um, it's, it's, it looks pretty awesome. But anyway, enough about 3D printing. So we got a question that got sent in this week, and it's uh, from Trails Custom Woodworks. Hi, guys. It's Isaiah from Trails Custom Woodworks from the Big IG. This week I have a few tips for you and one question that is one huge question. So first, my, t- my first tip is mostly for Josh to solve his tape measure losing issue. I have this really slick belt <laughs> slash pocket clip from Magneto. You can find them on Amazon. They, it saves so much time because it's just a magnet that cl- clips to this belt clip. And it's a huge time saver. I definitely recommend you add this to your collection. For, second, my tip is for all of you, I lose pencils all the time. And I always make sure I have at least two on me either in my hat or in my pocket, so I'm never losing one. Okay, enough is enough. My question for both of you today is, if you were to be given plans to build a cutting board 15 inches long by 12 inches wide, 1 inch thick, how would you do it with the cheapest materials in hardwood? What wood species would you use? And second part of this question is, how is the quickest way to do this? Think that you're... Do, doing high production on multiple cutting boards. This also means you're using more than one piece of wood. You're gluing up a panel, so multiple pieces. How much would you sell this product for? Thanks, guys. Can't wait to hear your responses to to these questions. Keep up the great work. Well, um, I do want to hand on one thing. Man, that would work great. I would have to put pants on in the workshop, and I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a family yeah. show. I had to. Oh my lord! And then the second is from uh, for the pencil. Alex Snuggrass actually had a great idea during this expo that uh, you put a magnet on your pencils and you put them on your machinery mm. throughout the um, throughout your shop. And actually, I picked that up and I actually have multiple pencils on my bandsaw, my drill press, and stuff like that. So. Even if I misplaced the one I had in my hand 10 seconds ago, I know right away where I can go to get some more until I use them up. <laughs> so. You know, pencils are yellow, and I lose them all the time. They I, could be fluorescent, and I, I, I still would lose them. <sighs> Speaking of fluorescent, real, real quick, my tape measure is fluorescent green. I've lost – I have three of them. I lose them. I put it down on the bench. It's gone. I don't know yeah. where it goes. It goes to like tape measure heaven or something. Well, it could definitely go somewhere because like I literally, I, 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 I'm very particular in how I like my shop. Everything goes in a certain place. When I'm doing mm-hmm. a job, I don't know what happens. It's like I go into <laughs> ultimate dimension where I just decide to put things in the most random places. It's almost like I'm yeah. so caught up building things in my head or building that it's like I forget where I am. <laughs> but okay, so his 15 inch by 12 by one and multiple hardwoods production style. That, that, um, man. and how would you do it with the, the cheapest, the cheapest material? I would start off with ash. Uh, ash is fairly cheap. It's a hardwood. Is it, it yeah, it's a hardwood, but is ash good for cutting boards? Because I don't know. I mean, its density is pretty hard. Um, I would have mm. to look at the exact density of it. We're going to go on the line. Yeah, you you can uh, go ahead and do the the interweb search. What is that scale called for the hardness? Hmm. The J- Jenkins scale? Yes. Yes. I'm, I think I'm right. I think you are too. Um, I'm just agreeing with you because I can't in. remember. Is ash <laughs> good for... Butcher block. Ah, oh, there we go. Google to the rescue, everybody, and I hope this stays in. Um, ash is known as the wood choice for baseball bats. It has a good overall strength, provides, yeah. Yep. So, but yeah, it says bar tops, butcher block, countertops. See, I haven't worked with ash, and I haven't really dealt with much of it. I am doing it now because of the uh, serving uh, trade that I'm doing. But uh, it's hmm. a cheap, a cheaper hardwood, at least in, in our area. Um, yep. I'd use walnut. Because walnut's really not that expensive. One thing I would th- – the the more I'm digging in while you're talking about this, it looks like it's used for countertops and not direct food contact. 
So I'm wondering if they're saying it's good for a kitchen, but I don't know if it would be good for a, an actual, actual cutting board. Well, if you did end grain, it's going to hold up better than if you did face grain anywhere. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm not trying to derail your idea. No, I love no. the idea of ash. I, I honestly don't know. I've never used it as a um, cutting board material. I know I use the cherry, the walnut, the maple, and, you know, the paduke and the purple heart and stuff like that. Oh, you yeah. know, pretty much the standard stuff. But if we're talking a production style, we're talking about, you know, trying to do the cheapest oh, type of wood, you know, that's mm-hmm. going to give you the same great results. Ash, I see, is a beautiful piece of wood. And I think it would hold up, you know, fairly well to what you're trying to complete there. Um, you know, walnut, I, I have to use walnut because I love walnut. And then, you know, something for color, uh, cherry. Cherry is, depending on where you get it from and how you get it, could be on the cheaper side. Um, if you get it from like New Jersey Wood Forever, you get some good prices on cherry and some of those hardwoods. If you get mm-hmm. it from, you know, boards and beams, it's going to be more pricier because it's been killing dried and stuff like that. So oh, yeah. it really depends on where you source your wood from and what the prices are there. But um, I guess my initial answer would be walnut, ash. And then for the third one, I would try to give it some color. And I would just basically go shopping for, you know, the sale that week. Well, what you can do is, um, as you were talking, even if you go to a lumber yard, you don't necessarily have to get the um, the one with a lot of knots or voids. What we can do is rough lumber. So if you have the oh, tools yeah, to join yeah, it, yeah, plane yeah. it. Yeah. That's how I did this cutting But that's board more work. That, I mean, it is, but and if you can get style, a style, mm, you see, this is the hard, the hard part of the question. So yeah, you can sit around and mull over basically, you know, the cheapest hardwood with the production mm-hmm. style. Now you're talking about time. Time is money, and the less time you spend on actually getting and prepping the wood, the better. So even my idea from getting something that's not kiln and dry would not work mm-hmm. in this. So. You gotta wait. Exactly. So definitely ash. Um, walnut can be pricey, especially if it's kiln dried. Um, I'm not sure about cherry, though. I mean, you can. Why Why aren't you sure about cherry? And the price of cherry. I've actually never bought mm. it from uh, Lumberyard, so I'm not quite sure what the prices are going. Cherry is definitely, it's not terribly pricey. Um, but, you know, it's it's not, I mean... Last time I bought it, it was kind of, it was reasonable. It wasn't like dirt cheap and it wasn't like, you know, like Purple Heart. Um, yes, yeah, I think it's that nice, road. yeah, middle of the road price. That would be my first guess. So, you know, that would give you that nice color to it and ash. Mm-hmm. And then I'm almost thinking about some of the more, some of the different woods we haven't really worked with, like um, the Huckleberry, but um trying to think what I have. But also... If you're doing production and you haven't worked with it yet, then, I mean, this, this question's, you know, you can have a million different answers for it, but, um, what about doing the standards, even though, even though you might spend a little bit more money, you could stick with woods that, you know, so let's just go with the three basics. If you did the, the cherry, maybe walnut, and then, um, I don't remember. Oh, ash. You know how they tool, you know, like what you should look for, how they're going to work. Um, and then you don't have to learn it at that point, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it, it makes, it definitely makes sense. Um, and I think with those, you would stay within a reasonable cost mm-hmm. for the production itself. You can get those pretty much at any, you know, lumber yard. Um, yep. And, you know, you can knock those out pretty good. I mean, for the size he's mentioning, it wouldn't be that hard to actually, you know, put that together and you could do stripes and different, you know, designs and pretty much end grain, uh, fit, well, face grain. I wouldn't, if you're doing production, no end grain, definitely not. You're doing face but grain end, all day long. End grain, I, I, end grain does take longer, but it is a, it's a selling point and it does, usually you can sell it for more. You can, but let's just. Do the three woods plus the time um, that it's going to take 
you're well, you're gonna just break time, so close material, to even. materials too. Yeah, think of all that waste on a uh, and grain. Okay, so I, I guess for you know, I think where we're going is a uh, face grain come board with the uh, mm-hmm. ash, the walnut, and the cherry, and then you can mix up how those are you know striped in there or design wise, you know, have three different designs. So you have a different, um, you know, three different pieces that you could sell. And, you know, how much would you charge for that? <clears throat> well, it would depend on the price of the wood and exactly how much time I did it for. But for a face grain with three different wood species and we're saying different uh, patterns, yeah, I would probably go for like a sixty, seventy dollar range. It all depends on how many boards you're gonna plan on making, because then you can kind of calculate how many board feet of each board, you, uh, each wood you're gonna need. Absolutely, then, but we don't have that information. So I mean, like, yeah, just so, based off what you know, some of the boards I've sold in the past. That I mean, like I would, I would be able if you're making, say, let's say, uh, fifty boards. If you're making fifty boards, and you're making them so you can basically put out a couple of days, and then one day you have the finishing and you know the Wally or oil and all that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a production line, you know what I'm saying? So you 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 basically do all the glue ups that you can with all the clamps you can. The next day, you clean it up, you get it ready, sand Mm -hmm. it down to the final grit, and then you start popping the grain, and then you go right into any other, you know, modifications to you want, you know, your logo, which I would use my, um, my laser engraver instead of using my, uh, at your iron. That way it can do multiple words at the same time Mm -hmm. and, or at least two at the same time. And it take a couple minutes each. And while that's happening, I could be oiling up some boards and getting, you know, oil bath ready for them. And, you know, I think price range would be anywhere between 60 or 70. Um, yeah. I think I can make enough of profit to justify it. And with a 50 boards like that, make a, enough to, because projection style, you don't want to charge a higher amount. You want to mm. charge a uh, amount that they're going to sell like hotcakes because you're making yeah. qual you know a lot of them and you want them to sell you don't want them to sit there so i think that that would be at a craft fair or at uh etsy page would be a reasonable price that people would grab three mm-hmm. wood species different coloration and you know especially with the walnut and just the cherry alone look good together the ash yeah. would give it that bright stripe or that bright aspect when when you were talking about it, I was looking at the question again, and it what's the quickest way that you could do this? I was thinking if you got the the three woods, you can set your table saw, rip down strips. Let's say you had an a six foot board, you can either cut it all in one length or cut it into individual. Cut all your strips into different into different widths. So. Not just for, you know, the ash one with the walnut one with, and then the um, cherry one with, you do, you could vary it. So yeah. the ash could be like three different widths, same thing with the walnut, and then you can mi- um, mix them up so your boards don't look all the same, and you could have variation. You know, it's, you're using the table saw no matter what, so might as well just adjust it a tiny bit. You know, do one style of cut on all three boards, do another one a little bit thinner, maybe a little thicker, and yeah. then you have a stockpile, and then you could just start gluing. And if you got enough clamps, you can glue up a ton of boards. Oh, yeah, for sure. I like your idea, but I think how I do it was like yeah, I would take, uh, you know, depending how much boards, how many boards I have, I would have like two boards of cherry, two boards of walnut, two boards mm-hmm. of ash, and I would set the table saw run the strips and then go mm-hmm. for another two with a different setting. And that would give mm-hmm. me more of a production style than it would be adjusting like each time. Um, and that way you can calculate out like, you know, how many strips you do 
if I put, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, these six strips together, they're going to give me my, you know, 15 by 12. Yep. No, it makes it, you know, it's actually funny. He brought this topic up because I must've sent him some kind of mental vibe because I was talking with Kim the other night going this, this holiday season, I would like to maybe make a small batch of cutting boards, something that would sell. And, um, now we're really putting our mind to it, and but I like your idea. So I would cut the boards down to you know just over the the length I want, and then rip them down, and then I have mul- I could pick multiple pieces and make a couple of boards out of that. Then yes, you are a hundred percent right. That is more production than than mine because I'm doing like you know maybe six cuts and then changing the table saw. Well, instead of doing that, I can get maybe. 20 cuts and only, you know, move the table saw once and that's it. So I like your idea and I'm, I'm probably going to steal it when I make this like small batch of cutting boards. Well, even then, I mean, like you do it like that. And as during the glue up, I mean, like the way you do your glue up, you can change it up. And then if you really, Mm -hmm. you know, take a section of six, seven boards, throw them back on the table saw cut them up again and you can start doing patterns with that typically oh, yeah. usually use for you know end grain but you can still do it with face grain yeah you definitely could i i really really like that idea so just so you know i stole that idea from you i'm i'm not gonna i'm not gonna shout you out i'm i'm gonna steal it from you that's all, right, all good you're here from my lawyers <laughs> who are you <laughs> actually my lawyer just walked in here she's uh She's a cat. Oh, so hot. <laughs> as soon as you said your lawyer came in, I knew exactly who you were talking about. <laughs> um, so think high production. Yeah. I mean, I like your idea with the 60 to $70 range. It's definitely not too, too high. It's not too low. Um, you know, the biggest factor would be how much are you going to spend on each board with the wood? How much in, um, you know, uh, consumables, and then you can really dial in your number. But I think 60 to 70 is a real uh, good number to start with, at least. Yeah, especially like off the cuff without, you know, knowing prices, you know, where I'm going to get them, what the prices would Mm -hmm. be. You know, obviously your first, you know, you'd be sitting down, (laughs) board feet, yeah. (laughs) He's laughing because my lawyer just jumped up and made a sneak peek at AJ. But uh yeah, you know, figuring out your materials, you can really dial in how much you want to make for a profit off of that. And then from there, um, I, we can definitely give you a good price. But, you know, off the cuff, um, I want diversity in color because that's what people like. I will change a, my answer a little bit. They want diversity in color. People also like, you know, one color cutting boards too, like a walnut or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a, what you, man, she wants to talk. <laughs> <laughs> my, my cat's moving the mic. Um, but uh, like I have a white walnut board that I use personally. I made for our kitchen and it is face grain and it's white, beautiful. White walnut? Yeah, butternut. You've heard of it, right? Uh, well, I'm going to have to look this up. I've never heard of it. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's white walnut. Wow. That's crazy. That's really cool. But you're 100% right. Um, my booze block that I have is um, just maple. It's one color, you know, so, but it's, it's a nice, it's a heavy duty board. And I, I fell in love with it. I mean, you get different grain within that wood, you know, it's not, you're not using just like a melamine and cutting it Mm -hmm. down. So it's just stark white. The grain is always going to show different, especially when you um, put your finish on it, you'll definitely see that that grain pop through and then you'll have the variation. So even if you did, let's just say a whole maple board um, or a whole ash board, uh, an ash board, you know how crazy that grain would be? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, making that charcuterie board and that grain that's going to be on there is going to be beautiful. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're off shooting from your original question, man, but uh, you can definitely, if you sat down and you had enough wood and, just cut everything in one day, did as many glue ups as you can do with all the clamps you have. And you could do multiple boards per clamp. So if you have a set of 48, you know, inch clamps, you can throw a couple boards in there as well. White walnut is also known as butternut. Yeah. Did you say that before? I believe I did. Yeah. 
oh, I thought you said something completely different. Now I feel like an idiot. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't honestly remember. It, it is butternut and white walnut is a like, my God, I love the walnut species. Like I, I really do. Um, I actually have to make a walnut cutting board face grain f- to match. And uh, yeah, like I plan on doing a nice butcher block with uh, cherry, maple, um, w- w- butternut, um, walnut, and uh, what else? Maybe, maybe I'll put some ash in there. I think so because I actually have butternut sitting downstairs and I I never knew what it was. I just liked how it looked, and that's awesome that now I know I have white walnut, which is crazy to me because I thought it was just butternut. You know, it, I didn't know what it was. That's actually the first cone boards I've ever made was made of – I call it white walnut. I like walnut, so mm-hmm. I'm saying white walnut just, I don't know, sits better with me. Um, but butternut yep. is also the more commonly used term when referring to the white walnut species. That's awesome. I can't – I've never used it. Um, I definitely want to. You know, I've heard it tools well, so it does. Um, it's just like walnut. It's just white. Which you would think walnut being being so hard and what it's used for, like it would it would beat you up while you're cutting it and whatnot. That is a real smooth wood to to cut, uh, especially table saw, miter saw, everything. It cuts beautifully. Yeah, it's <laughs> it is. You know. I don't think we've ever talked about dream woods, like the the best wood, you know, combination out there. Maybe we have. I could have been Instagram live, but uh, <laughs> honestly, it it is my favorite wood to work with by far. Mm-hmm. It definitely is. I, I'm I'm right there. With, and the funniest thing is, I'm now with you 100. percent That walnut is amazing because making that little ring box. Ah, when I resawed it, even though it was on the when the wind bogged down a little bit, but it still cut beautifully. I cut the uh, miters on the table saw; they cut beautifully. I sanded it beautifully. It smelt amazing. W- walnuts. I'm just gonna start making flags out of walnut and charge way too much money. That's the dream, isn't it? <laughs> Build everything out of walnut and just charge whatever you want a you want a con board that's 15 by 12 by one. Yeah, it's twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> Guess who's buying this all stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, this cost one saw stop. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> it's to the cent. <laughs> you think people will get mad if you put? Let's just say you made a table. Table price, and the price is a domino, or price saw stop. You don't have money. As the the number, you just have what tool you want. Actually, that'd be pretty cool. Be like, okay, you want me to build this table? Buy this tool for me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Cut out the it's middle, it. man, man. <laughs> man, that'd be awesome. Click on that sort of stuff. But anyway, yeah, we definitely dove into that. That was a that was a fun one because I learned a lot on that one. You gave me great ideas. I now learned what butternut really is. It's white walnut, and I cannot wait to work out with it. I got it. I got a eight foot section sitting downstairs. I think it's like 10, 10 inch wide. It's S four S. Nice. And I'm getting too excited. Yeah, I picked it up from boards and beams. I'll, I'll definitely send you a picture of uh, the one I have in the kitchen. And face grain mm-hmm. holds up well. Um, I believe the Wood Whisperer did uh, a post a while back or a YouTube video, and he was redoing one of his first face grain cutting boards. Mm-hmm. And I think it was to his brother-in-law or family member. And he just basically said it's been three, four years, maybe longer. And he showed, you know, how much wear and tear it's taken. It looked Mm -hmm. good. He did a little bit of uh, sanding and brought it back to life and it was ready to go. So that's one nice thing about a real cutting board, a, a, a hardwood cutting board, because you can resurface it, you know, just by sanding it down and then oiling it back up. And it's like brand new. So um, that was really a good question. I really enjoyed hearing your answers, hearing, you know, how you would tackle some things, especially on a production side, because like I said, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. I'm probably going to wait until December 24th to start these cutting boards and um, I'll have them for the following holiday season. 
but you know, I'll be on track. Um, but it, it's good learning, you know, how you would do it because how I was going to do it was definitely going to take a little bit too much time. I, I really, really like your idea. So I'm going to steal it, like I said, and, um, hopefully make some cutting boards. Yeah, that's my lawyer uh, <laughs> telling me to withhold all questions and comments at this moment. But uh, just, just yeah, so man. everyone knows, that was Josh. <laughs> Thanks again, man, for that question. It was, you know, it was one of those things that made us think. We got to go back and forth and figure out some things, mm -hmm. and it's probably going to improve our workflow in the long run because of that. Because you know, learning someone else's process and then you know improving your own—that's what this community is all about, the Sawdust Nation. So. Definitely. With that, we're going to wrap this up. And like always, you guys can contact us at our Instagram pages at Crafted and NJ for AJ or North Country Woodworking for myself, Josh. We also have a podcast page on Instagram at Sawdust Nation Podcast. In addition, we have an email account that you can reach us at and send voice clips, Sawdust Nation Podcast at gmail.com. And if you're just not an Instagram goer and you have a Facebook, because like MySpace, everyone had one of those at one time, <laughs> you can always look us up on Facebook and it's the Sawdust Nation podcast as well. And whatever we post up on Instagram goes right there so you won't be missing any content. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Sawdust Nation. We are, we love to, I, he's, he's calling me a square for some reason and I'm not sure why. Oh, okay. With that, everyone, please go ahead and... Oh, that's a share? No, it was Apple. Apple review. <laughs> <laughs> this needs to stay in because that was great. Anyway. They're not going to have no, the visual, I, though, he, me he trying to make an A. Up. He tried making an A. It was like a slanted down square that was like on a hill. I didn't even. It looked like a P. Look, look at the. That that actually P. looks that looks like a D. That, that, okay. <laughs> anyway, I, I, we're trying to tell we're trying to tell each other to mention that if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review. Um, you know, you can write one in. You could just click the stars. Let us know. Let us know what you think of it. And we would really like a comment. You know, just put out there. You don't have to use your real name. You can just uh, write number one fan. You know, comment what you like about the podcast. Definitely me and Josh's cat. And hey, 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 you were falling asleep today. I don't want to hear it. Well, you ever listen to you? This is the number one sleep podcast out there. The number one sleep podcast? What, what? Put you to this sleep. This is Sleepy. Well, thank you for uh, listening to another episode of Sleepy Time Podcast. So anyway, thank you for listening to another episode of Sawdust Nation. I'm Crafted in New Jersey. Josh. Dog Country Working. <sighs> is not falling asleep this time? Yeah, I'm wide mm. awake. For now. Oh. Anyway, Josh is going to go cuddle with his kitty cat. And I am too. So... We'll catch you back here on the next episode of Sawdust Nation. Sure. See ya.